Uh, I have great privilege in introducing my dear friend and someone that I have really looked up to for a very long time, uh, Bob Dylan of Google. Uh, Bob is the managing director of sales for Google Customer Solutions. Uh, he is a former intelligence officer in the United Navy, uh, United States Navy, and he earned his MBA from Wharton and holds a bachelor's and the master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, I, I think one of the things which I, I was sort of hoping to sort of get this one, Bob, because the number of agencies and the number of advertisers Bob talks to on a regular basis is higher than anyone at his level probably that I have ever seen in my life. So with that introduction, uh, no pressure, Bob, but on to you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm just incredibly excited to be here today. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, for the purposes of, of just kind of uh, kick off, many of us have been um, managing our way through a really difficult pandemic throughout the course of COVID-19. What I'd like to talk to today is just about the practical implications of the impact of the pandemic on consumer and shopper purchasing behaviors. The hope is that the insights that I share today will be helpful to many retailers and brands as you think about your business, not only now, but throughout the, the course of the coming months. So three things that we'll talk about, we'll kind of start with a section on what is happening with respect to online shoppers. The second core theme will be with respect to what's happening to in-store shoppers. And the third piece is, if those two pieces are kind of looking backwards in time, looking forwards in time, what are shoppers telling us about the way that they expect to behave as we move forward into the holiday shopping season? There's a bonus section here, which is I'll talk you through three Google tools that might be helpful to you at no additional cost. Again, for retailers that are interested in understanding a bit more about the consumer and what's changing in the landscape. Again, the hope is that these insights can lead you to helpful actions to understand the broader landscape and to drive your business to success. A lot of the data points that you're gonna see, and this is a very data heavy presentation, uh, are coming from Google Consumer Insights relative to search query data. We've also done a partnership with Ipsos where we commissioned a study of US consumers looking both backwards as well as shoppers looking forward. So if you're thinking about the data source, that's where a lot of the data is coming from. And before I actually get into the data, I'd love to just share a personal story, which I think probably many of you can relate to. And everyone loves a good shopping story. So uh, as I'm sure many of you, our children are returning to school here in the next couple of days. And we've come to the realization that our children will not actually be returning to the classroom. They'll be taking their classes from home. We live in California. Um, we needed desks for our children. And we first set about, my wife and I, Corinne, going online, searching on multiple sites to find desks that met our criteria, right? Uh, basic drawers on the desk, a basic desktop, a relatively low cost. And what we found was that many, many online retailers were out of, either out of stock or actually couldn't ship to us within a reasonable period of time. That was a huge concern. So we ended up scuttling the whole idea of buying online. We couldn't wait one or two months for a delivery, and we decided to build our own. That meant going to buy pieces at the container store and pieces at Home Depot. At the container store, we actually used the buy online, pick up and store capability, something that we had never done before, but it was incredibly convenient. When it came to buying the actual desktop, we looked across Home Depot, we looked at Lowe's. The conclusion we came to was that that product actually wasn't in stock in, stock in most of those locations, but there was one location in a, in a nearby community called Milpitas where Home Depot had three of those desktops in stock. So in the course of just a couple of hours, we did all of our research online, and then I jumped in the car and went to both of those retailers within a one hour period and picked up all the pieces that we needed. I essentially consolidated our shopping trip and we did it in a very safe way, a very efficient way, in a way that got us everything that we needed in a relatively short period of time. All of those experiences and, and kind of the, uh, the challenges that we faced, again, I'm well. And as we step through the, the next several minutes of insights, I think you're gonna find there's a lot of data that shows a lot of people are experiencing the same challenges and that retailers are finding a way to meet those consumer challenges head on. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So think about, uh, take yourself back in time to April and remember those days, I think they'll go down in infamy. In April, everybody was looking for essentials. And when I say essentials, you know exactly what I'm referring to. 
people were searching from for toilet paper. There was a black market for toilet paper in our community, a secondary market. People were looking for hand sanitizer or wipes, all of the things that were kind of core to being safe in their homes. That was in April. Over the course of the ensuing months, from April to May to June, we saw a decline in the number of people that were exclusively focused on buying the essentials. It's still really important, but it's not the entire story. If we could go to the next slide, please. So starting on the left-hand side, here we're looking at just the June data. We take that, that data point, that 50% from the previous slide, we still see there's a lot of people on the left that are really just focused on buying essentials. But the important insight is that people have begun to shift their focus away from just the essentials to buying things that they want, need now that are non-essential and things that they may want to buy in the future, again, that are non-essential. So there's this new opportunity for retailers and for brands to start to meet consumers who are looking for those things that they enjoy now or things that they might need in the, in the future. It's not just about the essentials anymore. Next slide, please. So two important insights around what are shoppers actually open to and what are we seeing with respect to shopping behavior? The first data point is a really important one. And I think about my parents. My parents were 75 years old. Prior to the pandemic, they did not do any online shopping, perhaps aside from shopping at Amazon on occasion. But the pandemic has brought an entirely new set of visitors to buying online and exploring the online retail experience. We see 41% of all retail web visitors were new to that experience between March and July. Importantly, these people are gonna come online, learn a behavior, realize it's a really valuable behavior and then abandon it. We expect those new populations that have come online to retain that behavior and continue to shop online. We call this a once in a lifetime digitization opportunity. New populations are online and they're buying in ways that they haven't before. And when they come online, they're actually open to buying a brand and they're exploring brands that, that weren't common to them or familiar to them prior to the pandemic. And importantly, again, once they actually engage with that new brand, they say they'll continue to buy that brand after the pandemic subsides, hopefully in the not too distant future. About a third say they'll continue to buy. So this represents, again, a once in a lifetime opportunity for retailers and brands to find new consumers online and also to win their loyalty online. Two huge opportunities. If we go to the next page, please. So as consumers think about buying online, what is really important to them? And I won't go through all the points here, but on the left-hand side, discounts are very, very important. We're gonna see over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, the degree to which discounts, consumers are looking for discounts at every stage of the purchase journey, whether it's online or actually in the store. And when they're looking for these discounts to the right-hand side, you're gonna see them looking across every possible channel, both online and offside, offline. The online channels are things like the store website or the store application. They're looking for emails from retailers and brands to let them know that discounts are available. They're also searching online for deals or sales or promotions. So consumers are willing to wait, they're looking for that discount, and they're willing to wait until that discount is available to them before they actually step forward and make the purchase. Maybe they'll put something in their shopping cart, wait until they see the discount, and then come back and actually make that purchase. They're looking at a longer buying cycle and they're willing to be a bit more patient. Next slide, please. Also importantly, there's a new set of behaviors and a new set of heightened expectations with respect to shoppers. There's a real focus on quality. There's a focus on is something in stock? And there's also a focus on getting it delivered to my home at no charge to me. So on the top left-hand side, this concept of quality, we look at Google search query data globally on a year-on-year -year basis, and we've seen a 700% increase in the number of people that are actually searching for the best grocery delivery. In my family, we actually never purchased groceries for delivery to our home online prior to the pandemic. We are doing it now, and it's a behavior that will probably continue after the pandemic subsides. On the, on the right-hand side, there's also been a massive increase in the number of queries that are focused on with free delivery, a 300% increase in those types of queries. The core expectation is that consumers don't wanna pay 
for something to be delivered to their home. It's a convenience issue. And on the bottom left-hand side, importantly, consumers are very concerned about shipping delays. We've seen a, a real backup in uh, FedEx and other home delivery mechanisms. They're essentially operating at full capacity. Consumers are aware of this and they don't want to see shipping delays. And if they do have a shipping delay, they want to be closely informed as to when something will actually be delivered. So about half of consumers say that they actually expect to be informed when there is any kind of shipping delay. Again, all of these insights are really important for retailers to keep in mind and brands to keep in mind as they engage with consumers now and in the future. Next slide, please. So closing out the first section, which is really focused on online shoppers, three or four key takeaways. We saw essentially in April, shoppers exclusively focused on just those essentials. They've moved away from that and they're open to buying things that they not only need now, but will need in the future. We've also seen an entirely new population of shoppers buying online and buying through an online retail experience. And as they do this, they're open to exploring new brands. And once they establish that relationship with a new brand, a good number of them are willing to stay with that new brand. So again, a huge opportunity for maybe those fighter brands looking for the big chance to, to build a consumer relationship. And when consumers buy online, they are expecting a discount and they're willing to be patient and wait for that discount. Also, when they buy online, they're looking for a lot of information about delivery. They wanna know that delivery is free. They wanna know that it's available, first of all, and when something is going to be delivered, they want to be kept up to date on when it's actually going to arrive at their doorstep. And they'll be very frustrated if it doesn't allow at the expected delivery date. So that closes out the online shopper section. But let's also talk a little bit about the evolving role of the store. And in my introduction story, I talked a lot about big box retailers, our experience at Ikea, the container store, and, uh, and of course, Home Depot. The role of the store has changed in a very big way. And we've seen some winners or losers in that change over the course of the last several months. And we think it will continue to evolve over the course of the next quarter or so. So if we move to the next slide, just to establish a baseline around in-store shopping, we go back to January and think of this as a baseline. We had 52% of shoppers said they visited a store or mall in the past two days. And as you would expect, as we move through time and as the pandemic increased in severity, in April, we saw really shoppers being very concerned about their safety. Only 28% were then visiting a store. The good news is that we're now seeing shoppers return to the store. We only have data up to June, but you've seen we move from 28% in April up to about 36% in June. And my expectation would be that if we were to look at more recent data for July and August, we'd see even more shoppers returning to the store. So this is a good trend. Shoppers are feeling a bit more safe. They're feeling better about the uh, mechanisms that retailers have put in place to ensure shopper safety. And as a result, they're willing to come back to the stores to buy not only the things they need, but the things that they want. Next slide, please. I think another important piece to keep in mind is the role of the shopping experience in store has actually changed in a very meaningful way. The days of a family showing up to a mall spending hours roaming through the, the, the halls of the, the mall together, those days are behind us at least for the time being. We see about 60% of consumers or shoppers saying they're just gonna spend less time browsing in the store. I'm surprised that number is actually not just a little bit higher. We see about 50% of shoppers saying that they're going to spend more time planning their trips. So they're not gonna just jump into the store and wander the, the halls of the store, the, or the uh, aisles of the store, they're gonna spend their time strategically planning out where they're going to go and making sure that their shopping trip is highly efficient. And they're gonna do that through a number of mechanisms, building their plan essentially. They're gonna look for deals and promotions and they're gonna do this online. About half are gonna, are gonna do this. They're gonna be hyper-focused on understanding if something is actually in stock and available in the store. This goes back to the Home Depot example that I shared with you where I was able to find out that there were three of a specific product sitting on a shelf in a store that wasn't too far away from me. And they're gonna look into all the different ways that they can buy and collect at the store with a hyper focus on their safety. They wanna be in, they wanna be out, they wanna be safe. And a lot of them are willing to do this 
early reservation to buy online and pick up in the store. Again, very consistent with our experience, which was a great one at the container store. So if we go to the next slide, please. I mentioned again, as, as I thought about my trip to Home Depot and to the container store, I wanted to, to essentially do one trip, be in the store and out as quickly as I could. And most US consumers agree with that philosophy. We see about 70% of consumers saying that they're just consolidating their shopping. And they're willing to make, importantly, a number of sacrifices as they consolidate that journey. They're willing to not always get the lowest price. They're open to exploring new brands and move away from brands that they would normally buy. They're also willing to not only always shop at their preferred stores for all kinds of reasons. Maybe it's just overly busy. And they're also willing to explore this idea of curbside pickup, which is an entirely new behavior. So these themes around consolidation, but importantly, recognizing that there's a lot of sacrifices that consumers are willing to make as they seek to drive this consolidation. Next slide, please. A theme that I hit on just a moment ago, but is worth kind of surfacing at a higher level, is this notion of curbside pickup. I had never done, and my family had never done, curbside pickup until about three months ago. And now it's somewhat the standard of how we approach our retail experience. On the left-hand side, you can see how consumers in the US and globally are changing their search behavior. And they're proactively searching for concepts like curbside pickup and concepts like click and collect. We've seen a 3,000% increase globally, year on year, on terms like curbside pickup and a 600% increase on click and collect. This is a massive phenomenon that just didn't exist before. And I think another important insight is on the right-hand side. Not only are people kind of building this new behavior, they actually think that once the pandemic passes by and there are no longer restrictions, this is a behavior that they see value in, this idea of curbside pickup, and it's something that they plan to do as they move forward in time. If you think about it, retailers are making a large investment in curbside pickup, building out the infrastructure and the store space to make this happen. Consumers are building the behavior and practicing the behavior and getting value out of the behavior. So as both parties receive value from this new way of engaging, it's probably something that's here to stay. So if you've been thinking about not making that investment because you're not sure it will be here for a long time, we think it's here to stay. Next slide, please. Now your question might be, look, there's a lot of changes in consumer behavior. Is Google doing anything to improve the consumer, the shopper experience, or the retailer experience? And the short answer is yes. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but if you go into the Google shopping experience, you're gonna see a lot of new capabilities and features that just simply didn't exist several months ago. We're now providing information on availability and distance for retailers. If a retailer offers a buy online pickup in store, we're surfacing that in the user experience. We're also surfacing the idea of curbside pickup. All of these are meant to just reduce friction in the buying experience and to really help retailers tell consumers the full story of what they have to offer. Next slide, please. So key takeaways for in-store shoppers to close out our second section. The good news is shoppers are returning to the stores. We're now at about 36% in June. And we think that number's gotten even larger in July and August. When shoppers go to the store, they're taking a lot of time to really plan their store visits, and they're using a number of online resources to ensure that their store visits are meaningful and create the value that they need. When they go to the store, they're consolidating their trips. They're visiting fewer stores and they want to be in and out. And as they actually make those trips and plan those trips, they're willing to make sacrifices on multiple dimensions, whether that dimension is price or um, whether that dimension is uh, buying online, picking up in store, choosing a new brand, choosing a new retailer. They're willing to make sacrifices on multiple dimensions. And this idea of curbside pickup, it's a concept that's probably here to stay as both consumers and retailers invest and build that behavior. So let's go to our third and final section. So far, we've been talking about what we've seen from consumers looking backwards. We've also done a survey, again, in partnership with uh, Ipsos, a COVID-19 tracker, where we talked to US online consumers who actually plan to shop for the holidays online. We talked to about 745 consumers. 
to spoil the the uh, punchline here, the expectations that we saw looking backwards are the same expectations that we expect looking forward, both with respect to online shoppers as well as in-store shoppers. If we go to the next slide, please. Importantly, tied to that concept I mentioned before about just a, an acceleration of the digital journey or a one-time digitization event, about three quarters, 73% of US planned holiday shoppers actually expect to shop online more for the holidays. This isn't a surprise, but it's a continue, continue, continuation of the journey that we've seen over past years. If we go to the next slide, please. And given all of the nervousness and uncertainty that consumers are experiencing, they're gonna do all engage in all of those behaviors that we talked about earlier. The numbers are huge. They're gonna consolidate. They're gonna make a smaller number of trips. They're going to really plan early and they're going to plan online to avoid crowds. They're going to choose those moments where crowds are expected to be a bit lower. So there's kind of a flattening of population coming into and out of stores. They're going to want to ensure that something is actually in the store before they make the journey to the store to make that purchase. And they're going to do a lot of browsing online to make sure that the product is available actually in the store. And finally, Back to that point on price, which we've made a number of times, they're going to hold off on any holiday gift buying until they actually see a discount available to them. And they're willing to be patient because they're going to start a little bit earlier, giving them more time to find just that perfect price. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about our online shoppers versus our in-store shoppers quickly. Online shoppers, the key idea here is they're looking for a frictionless experience and a reliable experience. On the left-hand side, We've seen a large number of shoppers, U.S. consumers, that have had a bad experience during the pandemic when they buy online. I personally have had shipping delays, uh, you know, notifications from FedEx suggesting that something would be delivered on day one, but then it was not delivered uh, day two or three or four, and it randomly showed up on a certain day. A lot of consumers, probably many of you, have had that experience. So consumers have a set of expectations around online retailers, and they're gonna to flock to those retailers that actually meet these expectations. They wanna be uh, notified if there are shipping delays. They wanna know that discounts are available and they wanna be notified about them. If something is out of stock, they want that to be very, very clear to them. And they also, once they purchase something, they wanna know that they can return something back to the online retailer if it doesn't meet their needs. Again, no huge surprises here, but this idea of frictionless is a really important one. If we go to the next slide, if we move from frictionless online, the in-store shoppers are hyper-focused on really exploring safe options. Contactless checkout for an in-store experience is kind of a baseline expectation, but consumers are looking for another, a number of other capabilities, whether it's a self-serve checkout, so they don't have to actually engage with another person, thus reducing safety, they're looking for dedicated lines for online, uh, for buy online, pick up in store. They don't want to be waiting in a standard line for long periods of time. They want a quick and frictionless and safe experience and an expedient experience. They're also looking or willing to explore things like self-serve, uh, same day locker pickup, or even booking an appointment online to actually then go into the store with the expectation that the store is a little bit less busy and providing a bit more of a curated experience. So that's what our, uh, our holiday in-store shoppers are looking for. So kind of the key takeaways, these recent behaviors are definitely going to carry forward into the holidays. Everything from safety to looking for a frictionless experience. Those online shoppers are hyper-focused on frictionless. They want to know that something is in stock. They want to know the uh, price, that it's a discount. They want to know that shipping is available, and they want to be informed if there's any kind of delay in shipping. And the in-store shoppers, are looking for those safe options. Uh, contactless checkout, self-serve, a way to get into the store and out of the store as quickly as possible. If we move to the next slide, if there's one key takeaway from all of this, the time to prepare is now. We think that the holiday shopping season is gonna move forward in time. And rather than a number of very uh, intense spikes on days like Black Friday, it's gonna be much more of a consistent drumbeat that starts much earlier. So before I conclude, I did just want to offer uh, an insight into a few of the tools that uh, Google offers that are absolutely free of charge that might help retailers provide a better experience for their consumers through the holidays. 
The umbrella on this is the Google Holiday Retail Toolkit. And if you're actually looking for any of these resources, just go into the Google search box and actually type the title uh, of each of these slides. The Google Holiday Retail Toolkit, it's about helping you discover new audiences, strengthening your digital storefront, and just generally giving retailers a solid foundation for the holiday season. If we go to the next slide, and there are two capabilities inside this uh, toolkit that I think are particularly compelling. The first is rising retail categories. Now, imagine that you could get access to all of the Google search query data globally and understand on a day-to-day, real-time basis, what are consumers actually looking for, which categories in retail are on the rise, which are on the decline, and even which keywords are driving those increases or decreases in demand. This is the purpose of the rising retail categories. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Even if you're not in the retail uh, business, it's amazing to see what consumers are actually doing, again, on a real-time basis through a very simple and friendly user interface. Next slide, please. The final piece that I wanted to mention was the Google Grow My Store tool. And the concept here is simple. If you have an, an online store, you go into the box here, you enter your website URL, and what we'll do is we'll give you a customized support, a customized report that will essentially benchmark your store relative to others that are similar to yours based on the product information that you have, the mobile experience, the degree to which you do or don't provide flexible fulfillment. The core idea being to give you kind of a scorecard about areas that you might want to look into to ensure that your store is compatible and competitive with others in the marketplace. With that said, I actually want to uh, thank again everyone for the opportunity to share these insights with you. I hope it was valuable to you. I hope it will, if you're a consumer, it was interesting. And if you're a retailer, I hope it was helpful to you as you think about success. And I think with that, we're gonna turn over to uh, a couple of questions uh, if we still have time. We do. We do, Bob. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, before we jump into it, there are a few questions that, that came in from the chat and some of the insights that you provided, I think, with us speaking to a lot of retailers, small business to mid-markets, a lot of valuable insights. Something I took away is is the 41% of retailers who, who visited websites were new. I think that's, that's crucial information for a lot of brands that are looking to get their name out there and get in front of customers, let alone just new customers. And the other piece of that is the 32%. Of, of new purchases where, where folks that purchased from a brand they weren't even aware of. So all of that is, is definitely value, very valuable information. So thank you to, to you and the, the Google team for sharing all of that. Um, we'll start with the, the first question. This one is a, a kind of like a three-part question. So um, it's, it's going to be based off, do we have any guidance on messaging? And what do consumers want to hear from brands right now? And what will they want to hear come the holiday season? So I heard um, guidance on messaging, and what do consumers want to hear from brands specifically, and then what will they want to hear as we move forward? Um, okay, three-part question. I'll try to keep those three things in mind. So I think with respect to, uh, to messaging, I, I, I hit on this a few times over the course of the last few minutes, but safety is, is paramount. Safety and efficiency, I think, are two concepts that are paramount. In safety, a lot of this is really about the in-store shopping experience. I won't rehash some of the content that I covered. And the efficiency piece is around um, you know, being informed of, of shipping dates and, and really holding true to those shipping dates. But all of the concepts of curbside pickup, buying online, picking up in-store, all of those things certainly hold, hold true. And when I think about um, what consumers want to hear from brands, I actually find inspiration in, uh, I know mean, many of you are, are familiar with uh, direct to consumer brands that are kind of on the rise or have done incredibly well. And I, and I won't name them, but I know that you probably all have your favorite direct to consumer brands. But the thing is that I, I find them doing really, really well, um, especially as they're trying to win new consumers, is that they're kind of emphasizing their brand story or their mission. They're, they're, they're elevating that uh, in, in a way that connects with the consumer. They're, they're also doing a nice job of, of guiding their shoppers to a, a fairly curated and simple uh, product set. So they're not kind of showering them with the universe, but narrowing them into things that might actually work well uh, with the consumer. And once they've built that brand relationship, the D to C brands are doing a nice job of just um, strengthening that relationship through continued interaction with the consumer. And then the final piece, I think just that the DTC brands do real well, 
they, they really do a nice job of um, putting the customer experience above all else and making sure that that customer experience is, is a fluid and frictionless experience uh, at every stage. So I hope I hit on the three questions. Um, happy to move on to others. Absolutely, absolutely. You did. Thank, thanks, Bob. Um, the second question we did get in, easy question, I think. When should we start running media for holidays? Yeah, I hit on this a little bit. I, I think the there are some kind of keywords to think about. Like unpredictable is a word that comes to mind. Um, so I'm trying. I'm sitting here trying to predict, but I think the word unpredictable comes to mind. And if anything, early is uh, something that we should all be focused on. So I talked about that month of September is probably an important moment for holiday shoppers and holiday retailers to be uh, thinking about the future. Um, I think those are two. We, we were in a conversation with, with Udayan from uh, Net Elixir, who obviously you've, you've met, and, and a number of other e-com partners. And uh, we, we just uh, generally agree. It's rare that everyone agrees, but we agree that the shopping journey is just going to begin much, much earlier, uh, you know, as early as three months prior to the holidays. So it gives us time to, to plan. I would recommend to any retailers that are thinking about their holiday season to just start ramping up their media uh, as early as mid-September. And that serves two purposes. It, it gets those consumers that are early in the shopping journey, but it also um, allows a retailer to kind of collect the data that they need to make informed decisions as they move further down uh, the timeline. And especially as you think about, we talk a lot about automation at Google, um, in order for our algorithms to learn, they need a lot of data. The more data that they have, the more effective they can be. So by starting a little bit earlier, we feed our, our algorithms and our machine learning with the data needed to make really smart, informed decisions later on. So, so early uh, is the key message, and expect an unpredictable ride. Absolutely, I think we echo the same same message at, at Netelixir. We try to get our clients up and running by by July, early August. So, perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, we're we're running early, so there's a few more questions that that we have. Um, sure. So, question question three that came in. Do you have a point of view for, for SMBs on how they might be able to compete against some of the big retailers this season? Um, so how SMBs compete with big box retailers. Yep. Um, so I, I, all of us are, are reading the news. Many big box, I think that the big box story is, is a tale of two cities. We obviously um, see the Amazons and the Walmarts, not the Amazons big box. But certain retailers have been incredibly successful over the course of the last four months, especially those who were able to deliver on essentials. We've actually seen a large number of big box retailers suffer, and, and many um, we've seen a, a number of, of smaller retailer uh, brands uh, leave the marketplace, as well as some of, of those that we knew for uh, decades. So I think there's this, it's a seismic shift, there's a unique opportunity, um, and we should, as retailers, we should think about where are those pockets of opportunity and really uh, pursue those? In terms of, of kind of what SMBs can do, I, I kind of harken back into that, the DTC discussion that we had a few moments ago. It is a unique opportunity for SMBs, knowing that people are willing to switch brands, knowing that they're willing to explore things that they maybe weren't in the past, knowing that they're coming online, some new populations for the first time, just extending your reach further it's a unique moment in time to kind of capture new audiences, capture new consumers. And then once you've actually got those new consumers, again, thinking about the DTC brands, really just building a relationship with those consumers to make sure that that, that is a, a sticky thing that will last over time. And I'll, I'll go back again to, um, you know, there, there are certain capabilities that I think level the playing field for all retailers, whether it's an SMB or a big box retailer. Automation and machine learning, um, especially for SMBs, it's something that, that maybe SMBs weren't, couldn't build on their own, but they can leverage the capabilities of, of online digital ad platforms. So I would certainly encourage SMBs to leverage the power of automation to, to take a look at all of the thousands of signals that are happening at any moment in time and to really uh, inform their, their advertising decisions. So I think automation is a, is a key theme that we generally talk about, but is particularly important in this very volatile and unpredictable time. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. And I think yeah. we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, you touched on, on this one briefly when you mentioned the, the curbside pickup and how it has increased. I, I believe you said 3,000% was the, the, the search, search. Correct me the searches, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the search is correct. All right. I got that number right. Yeah. Um, but the question is, do you expect that market, do you ex does the market 
trend expect curbside pickup to be available on the same day? I know as a, as a consumer, I have been frustrated when something wasn't available on the same day. So mm -hmm. I, based on my own experience, we didn't ask that specific question about curbside pickup on the same day. I, the fact that you're asking the question or somebody asked the question, and in my personal experience, if that's not available, it's again another point of frustration. I think it could be a competitive advantage. So my short answer would be yes. Yep. I have experienced the same thing. Yeah. And then we, could, we could wrap up with, with one last question, and sure. it, it really highlights the, the Google Holiday Ready Toolkit that, that you highlighted, Bob. Yeah. Um, so this question comes from, I'm assuming, Mexico. So is this going to be available in Mexico this year? And what other tools can you recommend for Mexican retailers? Yeah, so I, I don't know the answer about Mexico specifically. I will follow up on that and I'll make sure that information is available to you. Uh, I Somebody, nope, I thought there might be a chat comment that addressed the question. My, my understanding is that this is a global toolkit. And even if it isn't a global toolkit, we have a, a slightly more complex version of this, which is called Google Trends, which again is available to everyone. So it's less focused on just retail and that is absolutely available on a global basis. But I would just recommend that the person who wrote the question, um, I'm not gonna give, I'll give your email address. So the, uh, the person who wrote the question, do the search query for Google Retail Trends, and I think you're gonna find that available. I know it went out to markets around the world, and Mexico is obviously a huge market, but do the, do the search, and if you're not finding what you need, you can reach out to me or to, to the friends at Netflix. Absolutely. We'll, we'll keep that in, in mind. We'll ask for our back end team to just get a hold of the contact information for the person that asked that question. So that that wraps it up, Bob. Um, again, huge thank you from the team thank here you. at uh, for, for taking the time to present to everyone on this on this conference. Um, any last, last words before we transition out? Or? Just thank you. I was able to, uh, I, I've watched several of the sessions earlier in the day and was inspired and I'm going to continue watching. So uh, thank you, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with this audience. Thank you. Absolutely, Bob. Perfect. So to, to everyone on the call, um, we, we for the next presentation, I'd like to introduce you to our, our Microsoft partners, and we'll get started with them in, at, at 1.15. So we'll take a quick four or five minute break and grab some lunch, and we'll head on, head on right back here. or everyone who is, is viewing.